first, let's recall our situation at this point. We just verify the correctness of the Fibonacci formula. But that was a verification, not discovery. Someone needs to give you the formula, then you verify it is correct. So then we apply a powerful tool to do this. In this situation, when already you have the result, you need to verify it. So usually it is a formula. Usually it is a formula that depends on some variable related to natural numbers, natural numbers, zero, one, two, three consecutive integers. Usually when you have that situation, there is a high percentage, the method we are going to use mathematical induction. So last time we applied mathematical induction to show the given Fibonacci formula is correct. You need to do a lot of math. It's not easy, but here you, I only need you to know the procedure. So you know there is such a procedure there, okay? I won't give you that kind of questions. So you do not need to worry about it yeah. because usually it's too hard for you, okay? Yeah. But that's not enough. Yeah. You rely on some someone providing you the correct result. That's a big requirement. Most of the time you do not have it. So you need to discover the result. Most of the time, the result is unknown. You need to discover it. Yeah. So in this topic, D.3, we will discover it, okay? So I will go through the details, how to discover the Fibonacci formula. Yeah. And actually this topic, if, you still remember a little bit in your discrete math. In discrete math, this topic is covered. No, right. So here, look at the title, linear recurrence relation. How to solve linear recurrence relation. Yeah. It is covered in the discrete math. Yeah, but here, I still, I like to from the problem solving point of view, to go through the details. Yeah, so let's start that story. Yeah. Yeah. All right, yeah, but here, although the formula here given, but we assume we do not know it. We need to find it. We need to find it from scratch. So you cannot use its structure. And you cannot, even you cannot use the golden ratio. You do not know the golden ratio to be used in this formula. You need to discover it, okay? Oh. All right, so let's start. Before we start that story, so let us, let me give you the, you know, the complete name for this equation we are going to solve here. Look at this equation, this recurrence, simple recurrence relation, but there is a not long name for it. So let me explain that name. Why we call this long name, the, this type of equations. Second order linear homogeneous recurrence relation with constant coefficients, long name. So each part of the name address some property of this equation. Address some property of this equation. First, second order, not first order. First order. 
second order. Yeah. For the first order, so what is the first order? For the first order, uh, if we recall that uh, power of Hanoi problem, yeah, that problem is simpler than this Fibonacci number problem. Yeah. So let's recall that power of Hanoi that problem in that one we have this is the recurrence relation we derived from a puzzle problem power of hanoi puzzle problem yeah this one is first order not second order first order You can see on the right hand side only one term related to C sub n. Yeah. C sub n minus one here, only one term. The second one is a constant. Constant we separate. We do not treat constant the same thing as the you know unknown term. Unknown term. C sub n something. C sub n minus one. All right. But in this Fibonacci, this equation, there are two f terms at the right hand side. The second order. Two. Yeah. Two terms and the subscripts consecutive. Yeah. Also consecutive. Yeah. If not consecutive, you jump, you know. Then we may treat as higher order. But here, two consecutive Fibonacci numbers, second order. All right. Linear. Yeah. Linear. This equation is a linear equation. Linear equation. Okay. Nonlinear. So what is nonlinear? Yeah. You look at each term, each term is a linear term. Linear term, first order, we call the linear term. First order, linear term. Yeah. If I write second order, for example, Fn equals uh, F square n minus one plus F, the second one, I do not need to put a square, still n minus two, you have a square term, then it won't be linear. The linear structure is broken. Okay, here we don't we don't have nonlinear terms. Square, oh uh, square, yeah. Otherwise, square root also nonlinear. So more complicated. You will put a square root. You know, more complicated. Yeah. But I, the simplest case is the linear case. We like the linear case, the simplest. Okay, all right. Next one, homogeneous. What, what's the homogeneous? Homogeneous here means the constant part equals zero. You don't have constant part, right? Yeah. If you go back to the Tower of Hanoi, you have a constant part. That's not homogeneous. That's not homogeneous. You have a constant part. But for the, the Fibonacci, recurrence relation, equation, there is no constant. No constant we call the homogeneous. That's easier, yeah, homogeneous case, easier than non-homogeneous case. Yeah. Hom non-homogeneous case usually a little harder, so we need to do one step. We need to do conversion. We need to do conversion to make it homogeneous. For example, this tower of Hanoi, we need to do one conversion. We add one, both sides. C m plus one equals two C m minus one plus two. After this step, we factor two out C n minus one plus one, right? And in this cm plus one, we call it dm, okay? 
then our new equation becomes dn equals two times dn minus one, right? Yeah, because this parenthesis, we can use dn n minus one. Look at this new equation. This is homogeneous. See? So we need to do one step to convert non-homogeneous to homogeneous. That's not hard. We can make it easily. Yeah. But if it's homogeneous, so we can work on it directly. Okay? Yeah. So with constant coefficient, yeah. the last phrase describing the property. Look at the constant of each term. One here, right? One here. Okay? One, one here constant. If you put two, three, look at two here, also constant. Yeah. What is a non-constant coefficient? Here, let me give you an example. Non-constant coefficient. F sub n equals n times F n minus one plus n minus one times n minus two. Look at this equation. The constant. The coefficient is not a constant. And n minus one, not constant. So if it's not constant, much harder. You can imagine how hard to solve a question like this. Okay, yeah. So here you can see all the properties described here make this equation very easy. Very easy. But second order, a little harder, second order, harder than first order. The good thing is we can develop some systematic method to solve this type of equation. We want to have a systematic method because later we can apply this method on the whole, this type of questions as a class. Yeah. For example, after we find the systematic method we can solve, not necessarily second order, okay? Yeah. Any order, okay? Certain order, linear, homogeneous recurrence relation with constant coefficient. Yeah. But but the higher the order the higher the solution, solution will be higher, but you know, harder, the harder the, the solution. All right, so let's, let, let us continue this story. Yeah, all right. Here I write the general case. Yeah, general case, we have capital A, capital B, constant, no, but a B should be non-zero. Otherwise, if B equals zero, you get first order. It won't be, it won't be a true second order type. Okay, yeah, yeah. But if A equals zero, we still have second order, right? Yeah, yeah because, you know, the, the subscript, you, you, you you look at the sub subsquare difference is two. The subsquare difference is two. Yeah, still second order. If A equals zero. Okay, yeah. yeah. All right. But for the Fibonacci equation case, capital A, capital B both equals one. That's very simple. The simplest possible equation we can have. Yeah, all right. Yeah, now let us find a solution of this equation. Solving Fibonacci recurrence relation. But I like to start from the very beginning. How, how can we find, yeah, because some method is quite special. So people may ask, how do you, how do you, suddenly you can get that kind of special structure 
for those type of equations. So I try to give you some justification. Yeah. All right. Here, let us take a special view yeah, solving this equation. First, we want to pay attention to the structure. If there is a uh, if there is a solution, what structure the solution should have? So we want to look at from that view the structure, the structure, the format. Yeah. So square, you know, exponential function, power function, yeah, that kind of structure. Okay, here what I mean. Yeah, the formula, the structure. Yeah, we want to use that we want to find the structure that can describe the solution okay yeah all right so let's consider a sequence yeah. fibonacci numbers as a sequence okay we want to represent the sequence using some special formula and we want to see what special structure we want to use for the formula? Yeah. That's the first question. Yeah. All right. Let us guess the structure. Yeah, the step, the guess step is important. When we need, when we discover something new, most of the time we need to make good guess. Guessing is an extremely important step. Yeah. Otherwise, if you if you do not make any guess, it's very hard to move forward, very hard, okay? Yeah, so guessing, very important. Yeah. But when you need to make a guess, you need to base something. You need to base the existing knowledge. You cannot make a baseless guess, okay? You cannot make baseless guess. Can you guess as a you know golden ratio related expression? No, that's baseless, right? Why you pick a golden ratio here? Right? Why you do not pick pi here? Why you do not pick square root of two here, right? So you need to provide some rationale for your guess. All right, so can we Get make this kind of guess. This guess is not easy. A power function. So our solution, we want to consider using power function to represent our solution. But this guess, you still you feel. What is your rationale? How do you justify it? Yeah. To justify it. Let me connect to tau of Hanoi problem because that's the first order recurrence relation. Remember, we converted to first order recurrence relation. Can you see the solution quickly? Can you see the because? To find a solution, it's very easy. Can you see the solution quickly? Power of two. Imagine the solution. Power of two. Power function. Oh, exponential function, sorry. Not power function. Exponent is a variable. Exponential function, all right? Yep, all right. Base is a, base is a constant. Exponent is a variable, okay? All right. For first order, the solution is exponential function. Yep. Here, can we have the similar structure? Because we base on the first order solution. We just, uh, you know, make some brave imagination, we assume our second order solution probably 
has the similar structure as the first order. Okay, but the base we do not know. T, the base T, we do not know. We need to find T base. Exponents still, natural numbers, K, okay, consecutive natural numbers, because we want to use sequence to represent our solution, sequence, okay? Yeah, Fibonacci sequence. Yeah. So our solution, we should also generate a sequence. Here, the sequence, we use the exponential function. Yeah. Or here, another name for it, geometric sequence. Geometric sequence, right? Yeah. T to the K geometric sequence. Another name for it. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So this connection, this imagination is very brave. Yeah. But many times we need to make a brave assumptions, imaginations. Otherwise, you cannot get, you know, brilliant results. Yeah. All right. So here, at the beginning, some of the details we like to ignore. This initial condition, that, that's some details, right? Yeah. But at the beginning, we like to ignore some relatively less important initial conditions. Because later, when we have more information, then we will fix the initial condition. So we delay it. Okay. Yeah. So at this point, forget about the initial condition. Yeah. All right. The first thing, can we, yeah. So here, we use the geometric sequence as some model, model, mm -hmm. format, pattern, model. Then Fibonacci, numbers we want to fit in this model. Can we fit in this model? Yeah. Yeah. In the real world, many times when you, need, when you solve real world problems, you, you need to provide a mathematical model. Here, this geometric sequence, that's our mathematical model. So now we want to fit Fibonacci number into this model. Okay, yeah. If the structure does not match, then they won't fit. Okay, only when the structure matches in a perfect way, then they fit well. Okay, yeah, fit seamlessly. Yeah, here, let's try to fit. All right, assume the solution, the final solutions. The solutions of this equation takes this exponential function form. Okay, let's plug in into the recurrence relation. That's easy. Yep. Suppose the t is unknown. We just find appropriate t. How about that? We just find appropriate t to make the equation, the whole recurrence relation, work. That's the important step, okay? All right, let's plug in into the original recurrence relation. So it becomes t to the k equals t to the k plus, uh, minus one plus t to the k minus two. Fitting in the model. Yeah. If you ask me why you can do that, okay, yeah, because we make a guess. We, our guess comes from first order recurrence relation. So there is a base for it, okay? It's not baseless. There is some connection, strong evidence. So it reveals, the first order solution reveals the structure we should use for the second order. Let's think in, the, in this way. Is it a natural thinking that second order solution 
somewhat should be connected to the first order solution? That's natural, right? Yeah. yeah. The fundamental structure should be the same. That assumption, that assumption should be quite natural here, quite natural. Yeah. So here we use that assumption. Okay. Yeah. So here, yeah, we're fitting this model. Let's try to solve this equation. Yeah. We can simplify this equation. We can cancel, simplify by canceling the largest common factor, right? These, the three terms, they have a common factor. So we can cancel out to simplify the equation. After the cancellation, we get t squared equals t plus one. It's a quadratic equation. And we're familiar with this quadratic equation. We solved it before. Yeah. This equation has the solution related to golden ratio, right? Golden ratio here, there is a connection yeah, because the equation, the quadratic equation coming from the Fibonacci recurrence equation connects to the golden ratio, this quadratic equation. And the solution, two solutions we know, T1, one plus root five, whole number over two. Yeah. T two, one minus root five, then over two. Two solutions, okay? When we find the golden ratio, we also, we, we got two solutions, right? Yeah. But we drop negative one, right? Because golden ratio cannot be negative. Golden ratio is positive. Golden ratio is not negative. Okay. Here, think about this question. Should we drop the negative solution or not? Should we drop the negative solution or not? The first one is positive solution. Second one, negative solution. Do you have any reason to drop or keep the second solution? Think about that. Because what is the T here? What is the T here? We do not assume as the ratio of any of line segments, right? Yeah. Here the T, it's not like golden ratio. The golden ratio we assume, it's the ratio of two line segments. But here we don't have that background. Here our T is not necessary the ratio of two line segments. No such connection. If no such connection, then there is no reason to drop the negative solution. Negative solution is also a solution. So we should keep, we have two solutions. We should keep both solutions. You cannot drop anyone. Okay, if you drop anyone, you will get trouble. You won't get to your destination because you drop some valuable information. Yeah. All right, so let's continue. Yeah. So we get two solutions, all right? So the next part, how do we use these two solutions. Yeah. First one, second one. We know these two different T numbers, if we plug in into our recurrence relation, both true. Both give us correct solutions. Yeah. All right. Let's plug in the first one into our recurrence relation. Is it correct? Yes, it's correct. No. All right. If we plug in the second 
although it's a negative number we plug in into our original recurrence relation, is it correct? Yes, it's correct. Okay, all right. Although we know these two solutions are not integer numbers, not integer numbers, irrational numbers, irrational numbers. If some people see the solutions we found are not integers, if they drop them, then you drop some treasure, okay? Yeah. Something very important, very precious, you throw away, okay? Yeah. Although not integers, but they are our, how, how do I say? They are our building blocks, building blocks for our final solution. Our final, yeah. so they're not our final solutions. Yeah. Definitely they're not our final solutions. Can we treat them as our intermediate solutions? Intermediate solutions, right? Not the final solutions. Yeah. Yeah. But we want to use these two solutions to build our final solution. How about that? To build our final solutions. Okay, that's the idea. Two non-integer solutions. Can we use two non-integer solutions, put them together? Yeah. So use use some special way to mix them. Yeah. Think about it. use a special way to mix these two special solutions to get one integer solution as our final solution. How about that idea? Okay, yeah, that idea. All right, pretty natural, yeah. All right, so the next question, how to mix these two solutions? Mix them, okay? That word is vague, right? You don't know how to mix them. That word is vague, okay? How do you combine in some natural way to get integer solutions? Next step, another important step we need to go forward. Yeah. All right, all right. So we consider combination of two existing solutions. So what kind of combination key? The combination, all right, yeah. All right, still we forget about the initial condition, yeah. So we just want to find the expression satisfying the original recurrence equation. Later, we will fix the initial condition. The last step, we will fix initial condition. At this step, forget about initial condition. Okay, all right, yeah. Yes, the next important question, how to combine these two solutions to get a new solution. Because if you combine them in a wrong way, you won't get a new solution, right? You have many different ways to combine these two solutions. But you need to pick the correct way. Otherwise, your combination could be a non-solution expression, non-solution, okay? So our next question, how do you guarantee your combination is always a solution? That step, right? Yeah, so that's, look at that step. Yeah. Here, we need to learn a new concept. That concept is called a linear combination of two variables. Linear combination concept. Linear combination, okay? Why linear? Remember, our recurrence relation is a linear recurrence relation, right? Yeah. Our original recurrence equation, it's a linear equation 
So it has the linearity property. Our original equation has the linearity property. Here we take advantage of that linearity property. So we can consider linear combination of two variables, this concept. Very simple concept. In algebra, yeah, we use this concept a lot, of, many times. Okay, so what's that linear combination? Constant capital A times X plus constant capital B times Y. You add these two terms together, we call the linear combination of X and the Y, two variables. Okay, yeah, capital A, capital B. These two con constant will be determined by other conditions. Other conditions. Now we, we can determine these two constant later. Yeah. But this linear combination representation is useful for us to take advantage of the linearity property of the original recurrence relation. Yeah. You may ask me why we use linear combination? Because this structure <coughs> matches the linearity property of the original recurrence re relation. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Take advantage of that linearity property. Otherwise, you do not make use of the linearity property. Yeah. All right. So now let's apply the linear combination, not on two variables, on two solutions. How about that? Here we apply linear combination on two existing solutions. T1 solution, T2 solution. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. The linearity, yeah. The new form of a solution, our new form of solution should be a linear combination of two existing solutions. Yeah. So let's do it. How about, how about this way? Capital A times the first solution plus capital B times the second solution. Adding together, we want to see, is this a new solution of the original linear equation? If you verify it, it's very easy to see it's a new solution. Yeah. Can you see it? New solution, yeah. Here, I want to quickly convince you this is also a new solution. Okay, all right. All right, so. Uh, yeah. Let me use T1, T2, yeah, because, you know, to write it quickly, okay? All right, so we know T1 n equals T1 to the n minus one plus T1 to the n minus two, all right? Also T2 n equals T2 to the n minus one plus T2 to the n minus two. Okay, all right. How about we use A to multiply the first equation and then B to multiply the second equation. Then we add these two equations, both sides. That's legal algebra operations, right? Yeah, that's legal operations. Okay, after you add them up, can you see this new form? That means T A times T1 to the M plus B times T2 to the M, it's this expression is also a new solution fitting the original recurrence relation well. Fits well. Yeah, that's a new solution. Uh, yeah. But with Coefficient A and B to be determined. 
for any constant capital A, capital B, it's a new solution. We get a new solution. Yeah. But this new solution, we have done some freedom in this new solution. Capital A, capital B, to be determined, that gives us freedom. We can choose suitable A and suitable B. That's our freedom. Freedom is a good thing here, right? Because we still, we have initial conditions to be fixed. Yeah. Initial condition, we, we haven't addressed the initial condition. How do we address the initial condition? We take advantage of this limited freedom. It's limited, yeah, but it's a freedom. Yeah. So we still, we have some room to do the manipulation to make our final initial condition fitting in the model well. Okay, perfectly fitting in the model in a perfect way. Okay, yeah. So let's complete the last step. Last step, addressing that initial condition. Solving capital A, capital B. All right. So how to do it? That's pretty simple. Yeah, because now we already know the new solution takes this form, but we don't know capital A, capital B. Can we plug in n equals zero and n equals to one to get two equations? When n equals to zero, we plug in, and after simplification, we get a plus b equals zero. Yeah. So simple. So b equals negative a. Yeah, that's simple. Then we still, we need a second initial condition, n equals one, we plug in a1, a1 equals one, yeah, plug in after simplification, yeah, we can do substitution, b by negative a, yeah, then, you know, do some cancellation, simplification, so we get a times root five equals one, and a equals one over root five. A equals one over root five, then b is negative a, so it is negative one over root five. Yeah, yeah. so we find these two constant numbers to make sure the initial condition is satisfied. Then let's go back to the formula. Yeah. New solution formula with A and B. Yeah. Here. Yeah. We are uh, here. We, we can use the golden ratio because we see that golden ratio appears in the equation, right? Yeah. Well, that's fine. That, that's not a guess. Yeah. Yeah. We see it clearly. So here we can we can use the golden ratio symbol to re replace one plus root five over two. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So with that, then our final formula is the famous Fibonacci formula. But this is a discovery approach not a verification approach, discovery approach. Yeah. We find something from scratch, yeah. from scratch. Yeah. But in our solution path, you can see we apply a lot of knowledge we learned before, okay? Yeah. And some imagination, assumption, connection, So try to understand this procedure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Any question? Yeah. So we finish this topic. Yeah. Any question? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, 
after today's class, I will give you quiz number three. Okay, yeah. Quiz number three. Yeah. So we, we have, you know, the knowledge after quiz two, we have many topics we need to cover in quiz number three. Okay, yeah. All right. And uh, also I need to think about, yeah, because we don't have, have much time. Yeah. yeah. So we also need to do homework assignment number two. Yeah. So with the limited time left, we need to do another homework assignment. Okay, all right. Yeah. yeah. All right, so that's this topic. Let's move to module four, new topic. All right. Module four, divide and conquer approach. So this is another another uh, very important approach in our algorithms class, problem solving. Yeah. Part A, insertion sort. Another sorting algorithm. Yeah. Here, we take a new view, new operation to find the solution. Insertion sort, 8.1, insertion operation. All right, so we revisit our sorting problem, yeah, the same sorting problem as before, but this time we take the divide and conquer approach. Yeah. All right, yeah. we start with a simple case first. Yeah, okay, start with a simple case. Yeah, all right. So then we grow the data size gradually, one by one. Every time we grow the data size by one more. Yeah, this approach. Okay, all right. Yeah. The question, how to connect two other JSON cases? Yeah. There is a gap, okay. to sort an array with n elements and a sort an array with n minus one elements, these two problems, there is some small gap. How do you fail bridge the gap? Okay, yeah, yeah. All right, so let, Let's work, do some experiments, do some work here, okay? All right, yeah. So by our Im imagination, intuition here, yeah. When we start, we start with one element array. How about that? Single element array. That's the easiest case. And it is already sorted. One array, can we treat as a sorted order or ordered array? Yes, you can treat it. It's an ordered array. Okay, yeah. yeah. Because it's not out of order. It's in in order, ascending order. Yeah. But also descending order, right? Yeah, special case. Okay, yeah. All right. Now, after the current data, so this is current data already ordered. This we treat as new data, A1. There is a new element comes in, join the existing data. So if we just put a, the new element in our current array, it may not be ordered. So we need to fix the ordering problem. Possible ordering problem. We need to fix it. Okay. Yeah. So, in an existing ordered array, how 
can we add a new element into it and make the new array order? That's the question. Simple question. We need to find a solution. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. Is this some kind of insertion? Yeah. Is this some kind of insertion? We insert insert to the right place. Yeah. Yeah. So here, although you may not connect to the insertion word, yeah, you you need to do one comparison, right? You need to do one comparison to determine if you want to place a one before a zero or after a zero, right? You make that decision before a zero or after a zero, okay? But one comparison is enough to make that decision, right? Yeah, all right. So then after one comparison, let's assume we have a larger ordered array, a zero, a one, ordered as the current or data, current array. Yeah. Next, another new element, A2 comes in and we want to add A2 in the existing array and make the whole array ordered. So we need to do a few more comparisons, okay? Yeah, a few more comparisons, okay, yeah. All right, so A1, A2, after a few more comparisons, we can get the whole array order. No problem, yeah. yeah. But you can treat as some insertion operation, yeah. You insert A2 at the right place in the current array. Insertion, yeah. This time, based on your intuition, yeah. It looks, you know, more and more like an insertion. Yeah. All right. Then we keep doing things like this. Every time when we get a new element, we do this kind of insertion operation. Then we can, at the end, we can make the whole array sorted in order, ascending order, yep. That's another sorting algorithm, right? Another sorting algorithm, yeah. Look at this view, yeah. It's completely different from what we have learned at this point. So it's a new sorting algorithm, okay? Yeah, all right. And here you can see this new view, new method relies on a special operation called insertion operation. So we need to study this special insertion operation. After we understand this insertion operation there, the whole sorting algorithm is there. Yep, yeah. everything is there. Yeah. That's the a new sorting algorithm and uh, it's complete yeah so we can apply it all right yeah so here we need to focus on this insertion operation how to insert a new element in an existing ordered array in its right place with the minimum cost, think about this word, with the minimum cost. Okay, yeah, all right. All right, so let's look at the details of this insertion operation. Yeah. So to implement this insertion operation, we need to you know, fix all the details here, one special step to take, shift elements for insertion. Yeah, let me show, let me use a diagram to show. 
why we need to shift the elements for a new insertion. Yeah. All right. Shift elements to the right. Yeah. Yeah. Look at the array. We know all the array elements occupy consecutive locations in main memory, computer main memory. Array always occupies consecutive locations, right? But when you add a new element into this array, you still, you want to get all the array, but that new array still occupies consecutive locations in main memory. How do you do that? Okay, in main memory, how do you do that? So here you need to do the shift operation. You need to leave some room for the new element. You need to find the location for the new element. Okay, yep. Yeah. So look at that operation. Yeah. All right, before you find a new room for the new element. First, you need to leave some blank space. This is a blank space, all right? Now, this blank space, original AK occupies this location. But here you copy, you copy the AK into a temporary, this is a temp temporary location. Get a temporary location and copy the last element in your current array into this temporary location. Okay, all right, yeah. Then do comparison from the last, yeah, you know, in this direction. First compare AK with AK minus one, okay? If AK minus one is greater than AK, shift it to the right, okay? Yeah. Move that location, copy a assign, yeah, assignment, we do assignment. Assign A sub K minus one to A sub K location. One shift operation to it's right, okay? Yeah. Then we compare with A sub K minus two. If A sub K minus two is greater than A K, we do another sh right shift operation. Copy, assign to its adjacent right location and so on, yeah? Keep doing that until, until, you get some place AI less than AK. Yeah. Because when you reach some point, you may get AI less than AK, right? Yeah. If, it, if it happens, if it happens, right? You know, if that happens, you know, you find the right place for the AK element, a new location for the AK element. Okay, then just copy AK in the temporary, from the temporary location to this destination, final destination location. Because this element is in place in this location. Yeah, yeah. But after you, you check AI less than or equal to, yeah, we include equal, okay? We include equal, less than or equal to AK, so we can place, drop AK into this vacant location because we already leave this location vacant, okay? We just put there. Okay. Then the 
whole array ordered. Whole array is ordered. Okay, yeah. That's the insertion operation. That's the details of insertion operation. Okay, yeah. The implementation is also very easy. Okay, yeah, all right. Now you can see if you do this kind of insertion operation again and again from beginning to end, yeah, you get a whole array order. All right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, in this step, if we want to describe the number of assignments, you, you need to do shift, shift, that's basically assignment operation, assign big theta of K. Sometimes you do not need to do, you know, sometimes after first operation, then first comparison, you find the right place for this AK. But sometimes you need to compare it with all the elements in the current array, the last element, the last element. Oh, after last comparison, you can find its destination location. That's the worst case. So you have best case, you have worst case. And you can take average case also. Yeah. Yeah. But but we can use big theta to represent upper bound, lower bound, right? Yeah. Big theta of K. Upper bound, lower bound. Yeah. Actually, probably better, better in big O, right? Yeah. Uh, Big theta, if we want to represent average, then it's better to use big theta. Average, okay? Yeah. Average case, big theta, better. Yeah. All right. All right, so the last step, implementation of insertion sort. So now the implementation, pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Yeah, we just do the, analysis of the efficiency, how many comparisons we need to do the insertion sort. Yeah. Estimate efficiency, compare and shift operation. We need to do both operations. After comparison, then we need to did, we need to do a shift operation or assignment operation. Okay, all right. Yeah. So you know, uh, like in this diagram. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Now let's consider the worst case. The worst case. Yeah. The worst case you need to do all possible comparisons. Yeah. All right. The worst case, when you start from the first element, you do not do comparison, but when you add the second element, you need to do one comparison for second element. For third element, the worst case, two comparisons, and so on, okay? Then, the last element you want to add into the existing array, you need to do n minus one comparison for the worst case. Yeah. Worst case, yeah. So you know the formula for the worst case, one half times n, times n minus one. That's the worst case. All right, yeah. Using our asymptotic notation, we use big theta of n squared. Yeah. Constant, dominant term. Yeah. This is the dominant term, n squared term. One half n squared term, dominant term. But when we use asymptotic notation, we don't need a constant one half. So we use big theta of n squared. That's the worst case. What is the best case for insertion sort? What is the best case? Every time when you insert a new element, you have the best case. 
all the time, okay? All one comparison, you find the right place. A minus one, A minus one. So the best case, you can see that's a big theta of N. Big theta of N. Yeah, yeah. Because we only keep the dominant term and the constant one, you know, just big theta of N. You compare best case, worst case, the difference is big. The difference from N squared to N, that's a big difference. Later, we will see a few more sorting algorithms. You will see only this one has this property. The worst case, the best case, the big difference is this big. This big. Okay, yeah. So this is a good property. So for the insertion sort, it's a good property because this case, so good. Linear efficiency, it's so good. We like to have it. If it's possible, we like to have it. So this insertion sort, for the best case, it can achieve, but not for the general case. For the best case, we can achieve it thus. Okay, yeah. All right. The average case, yeah, you need to do a little more work. Average case, yeah. Yeah, but the answer actually one fourth. So you multiply one fourth n square. Yeah. Still big theta of n square. If you just look at a dominant term, one fourth n squared. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. The the details. Yeah. I skip here. Yeah. So. It, yeah. But if you look at each insertion operation, you take the average case. Okay. Each insertion operation, you take the average case. Then you add them up. So then you you can get the overall average case. Yeah. All right. Conclusion. Before the break time, let's make the conclusion. Well, based on this property, this property is so good for insertion, so, so special. The best case is so fast. So we, in a special situation, this is a, the best sorting algorithm for some special situation. So what kind of special situation? All right. When the given array is almost sorted, yeah. if in the real world applications, you may have the situation, your data is not randomly distributed, yeah. it's not ordered, but only some small places, scattered locations, the data is not ordered. Yeah. So the data is out of order only as some relatively small places, scattered locations like that, small portion, small portion of the data is unordered. Okay. Most part ordered. How do you recover the, you know, order, ascending order, get it sorted. Insertion sort is the best. Yeah, based on, you know, it's best, uh, it's best case, big theta of n. So we take advantage of it's fast, best case efficiency. Take advantage of that. So we should apply insertion sort. If we apply other sorting, it, it will be much slower. Okay. Insertion sort is the best in this situation. Okay. All right. So that's the conclusion. And uh, let's, uh, let's take a break.